welcome back to It's an Inside Job podcast. I'm your host, Jason Lim. Now, this podcast is dedicated to helping you to help yourself and others to become more mentally and emotionally resilient so you can be better at bouncing back from life's inevitable setbacks. Now, on It's an Inside Job, we decode the science and stories of resilience into practical advice, skills, and strategies that you can use to impact your life and those around you. Now, with that said, let's slip into the stream. Well, welcome back, dear listeners, to a brand new season of It's an Inside Job. Now, I want to take a moment to express my heartful gratitude to each and every one of you for your unwavering support and listenership. You know, your continued dedication truly means the world to me, and I'm immensely grateful for your presence here. Before we delve into the captivating episodes that await us in Season 4, I want to extend a sincere thank you to the incredible guests who've joined me during our previous season. Their invaluable insights, their stories, and expertise made each episode a memorable and enhancing experience. To my extraordinary guests, thank you. Thank you for being a part of Season 3 and for making it truly exceptional. I also want to express my deep appreciation for the feedback and comments I've received from you all. Your engagement, your support, and your thoughtful messages have not only encouraged me, but have also played a vital role in shaping the direction of this podcast. Your active participation is invaluable, and I'm committed to delivering content that you find enlightening and thought-provoking. So as we embark on season four together, get ready to be inspired by a lineup of captivating interviews that delve deep into the stories and experience of remarkable individuals who have triumphed over diversity and achieved resilience, well-being, and mental health. And through the episodes that are coming through season four, we will explore their journeys of growth, learn from their strategies, and uncover the invaluable lessons they've learned along the way. And each episode promises to be a source of inspiration and insight, empowering you to navigate life's challenges with strength and courage. So, dear listeners, I encourage you to buckle up as we embark on this new season together. Join me on this captivating adventure of discovery, learning, and growth. And I truly, truly am I genuinely thrilled to have you here, and I can't wait to share these extraordinary stories with you. So thank you. So thank you for being part of my podcast family, and let's make season four an unforgettable experience. And with that said, I'd like to start the first episode of season four. And it's been a while since I've done a solo run, so here we go. So let's slip into the stream, and I'll meet you on the other side of this intro. Now, before we get started, I want to invite you to take a moment to pause, reflect, and consider this question. What ignites your inner spark? What fuels your fire and propels you forward? Ready to take on the challenges that lie ahead? I've asked this question to countless individuals, and without fail, everyone has an answer. So that means I'm confident that you too possess a deep well of inspiration within you. You see, the challenge we face is not knowing what to do or lacking strategies. It's that applying those strategies in the moments when we need them most can feel overwhelming and nearly impossible. Perhaps you can relate to those moments when you leave a conference, read a motivational book, or listen to an inspiring podcast. In those instances, you feel a surge of motivation and excitement, and you eagerly make plans to implement new strategies in your life. But as soon as reality sets in and the busyness of everyday life takes over, well, those plans fade away and you find yourself slipping back into old habits. Now, it's a common experience we've all had. When faced with failed attempts at change, we often resort to blaming ourselves, berating our lack of willpower or discipline. We blame our circumstances or assume that the strategies we choose simply don't work. But let me tell you, these explanations are based on a faulty assumption. We assume that logic will prevail in the moment we need to put our new strategies into actions. However, in stressful situations, our brains are wired for emotional reasoning, not logical thought. 
This is why we naturally lean toward what is familiar and easy than rather than what is best for us. Understanding how our brains are wired can shed light on why we struggle to do the things that we know we should. Our brains are optimized for survival and seek comfort. They prefer the path of least resistance that offers immediate rewards. But here's the catch. Doing what feels better in the moment is not always aligned with what truly makes us feel alive and fulfilled. You know, all of our brains crave challenge. Our brains thrive on learning, embracing change, seeking deep and lasting fulfillment. These experiences not only make you feel alive, but also strengthen your cognitive reserve. Your brain is adaptable and can change through a process called brain plasticity, or also what we call neuroplasticity. Now, by engaging in challenging activities and diverse experiences that push you outside your comfort zone, you can reshape your brain and build a more robust neural network. Now, I want you to think of your brain's neural connections as a backup system for accessing your experiences, your expertise, and memories. The more extensive and interconnected these networks are, the more efficiently you can tap into this wealth of information to respond and engage with the world. Additionally, well, when you engage in activities that make you feel alive and draw on your strengths, your brain builds denser connections and stronger networks. This is where your greatest learning, growth, and resilience will occur. Now, let's be clear. Comfort, ease, and happiness are not inherently bad or wrong. They have their place in our lives. But if we want to cultivate vitality and resilience, we must mindfully choose actions that align with our well-being. It's about finding the balance between comfort and challenge, between feeling better and being better. To navigate this balance, we must understand the key players in our brain's decision-making process. Now, I don't want this episode to be a deep dive into the science of the brain, of neuroscience. But what I want to do is just touch bases on four key players within this decision-making complex that we call our brain. Now, first is the prefrontal cortex, the second there's the amygdala, third, the hippocampus, and the fourth is a hormone called cortisol, which all play significant roles in shaping our responses to different situations. Now, let's begin with the first one. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for complex thoughts, decision-making, and regulating our emotions. The prefrontal cortex is part of the brain that allows us to plan, to set goals, and to exercise self-control. It's like the CEO of the brain overseeing and coordinating various functions. Now, the second player, the amygdala, it's the brain's alarm system. It's like the watchdog. It's responsible for detecting potential threats and triggering the fight or flight response. Now, when the amygdala perceives danger, it sends signals to the rest of the brain, leading to a heightened emotions and impulsive reactions, something we can call the reactive mindset. Now, the third player, well, this is the hippocampus. It plays a crucial role in memory function and retrieval. It helps us to encode and store information, including emotional experiences. Now, the hippocampus also aids in contextualizing our experiences and making connections between different pieces of information. Now, lastly, the last player is the hormone cortisol, or which is more commonly known as the stress hormone. It's released by the body in response to perceived threats or stressors. Now, cortisol is neither good nor bad. It's it's an essential part of the functioning of our bodies and our brains. But cortisol influences various bodily functions and can impact our mood, our memory, and our overall well-being. Now, why are these brain players important when it comes to building resilience and making positive changes in our lives? Well, it's because understanding their roles can help us navigate the challenges that arise when we try to break free from our comfort zones and implement new strategies. Now, when we're faced with a stressful or unfamiliar situation, the amygdala can become overactive, 
triggering fear and anxiety. In these moments, the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for logical thinking and decision making, may become less accessible to us. This can make it difficult to think clearly, exercise self-control, and make choices aligned with long-term goals. And I think each and every one of us knows what this experience feels like. However, With awareness and practice, we can learn to engage our prefrontal cortex even in stressful situations. Now, this involves consciously recognizing our emotional reactions, acknowledging the fear or discomfort, and consciously choosing how we want to respond. We can also leverage the power of our hippocampus to support our resilience, By intentionally cultivating positive and meaningful experiences, we can create stronger neural connections associated with joy, growth, and our mental well-being. You know, engaging in activities that ignite our inner spark, challenging ourselves, and learning new skills, well, overall, they can contribute to building a more resilient brain. So think about what is your hobby? What is your favorite sport? What is your favorite pastime? Because each and every one of those will contribute to this. Now, managing stress and cortisol levels is another critical aspect of building resilience. Chronic stress and high cortisol levels, well, they can have detrimental effects on our physical and mental health. Finding healthy coping mechanisms such as mindfulness, exercise, and social support can really help regulate these cortisol levels and reduce the impact of stress on our well-being. So, you know, the path to resilience and positive change lies in understanding and working with our brain's natural tendencies by embracing challenge, by engaging our prefrontal cortex, by nurturing positive experiences and managing stress. We can build a resilient brain that empowers us to thrive in the face of adversity. So remember, it's not about striving for perfection or never experiencing discomfort. It's about finding the courage to step outside your comfort zone, embrace the challenges that come your way, and to consciously choose actions that align with your well-being to ignite that inner spark. Over the last three seasons, I've talked about these different cognitive traps, these little mental pretzels we get ourselves into. Sometimes it's rumination, sometimes it's overthinking, sometimes it's the fear of perfection or the fear of the imposter syndrome that we sit with. Maybe it's the fear of conflict or the fear of being overworked or the fear of change. But today, what I'd like to address in part two of this episode is the fear of always living up to the highest standards. Many of us, you know, we strive for success and we believe that setting high standards is the key to achieving our goals. But what if I told you that holding yourself to unattainably high standards could actually hinder your success? Well, let me explain. Let me dive in here. To do this, what I'd like to do is talk about one of my clients. You know, in a recent coaching conversation I had with one of my clients, let's just call her Katya. She believed in the formula of all in, all day, every day for success. But lately, she had been considering stepping back from her role as a high-powered attorney. I had a one-to-one coaching session with her, and I asked, what if it didn't need to be so hard? What if you showed yourself the same compassion you give to others? Katya was kind of confused, and I can understand because I just kind of sprung these questions on her. You know, she had always believed that holding herself to the highest standards was what fueled her best work. You know, many successful people like Katya fall into the trap of believing that highest standards and ambition and self-discipline are the keys to success. And indeed, these qualities are crucial. They are significant and important. I don't mean to minimize that. However, when we hold ourselves to unattainably high standards, it becomes a different story. You know, Katya always set her standards. They were always there on the horizon, always impossible to meet. As she moved closer, then those, those goals would constantly move further and further. You can never reach the horizon. We all know this. She was, in a sense, a perfectionist who believed she had to be better than others in her competitive industry. 
Anything less than her high standards felt in conflict with her values. The idea of self-compassion seemed irresponsible and self-indulgent to her. Now, Theodore Roosevelt had a very famous quote. He said that nothing worthwhile comes easy. Now, this often leads high achievers to believe that if something matters, it should be hard. This thinking gives rise to damaging viewpoints, such as believing that successful people are always busy and exhausted, that superhuman effort is required, and that meeting expectations is not enough, that they have to super exceed them. It's a mindset of being perfect or being a failure. It's black and white. It's day and night thinking. When I'm running workshops for small teams or larger departments or whatever it is, you know, I've spoke about this earlier on the podcast. I, I speak about the idea of having an ace up your sleeve in order to build resilience. And that ace is just an acronym for self-awareness, self-compassion, and self-efficacy. And so right now, I'd like to talk a little about self-compassion. So when I'm, when I'm talking about self-compassion to, to participants, the first question I ask them, how many of you are too hard on yourself? How many of you lash yourself with self-doubt and self-critical thoughts? When I look over the audience, most of those people have their hands raised. Then I ask a second question. How many believe that showing support and compassion to others was important for healthy relationships? And in that case, also every hand shot up. So why is it so challenging to show the same level of compassion to ourselves? Well, I've been working as a coach for close to 25 years. And what I've come to understand is that many people believe that being kind to ourselves will make us complacent or settle for less than perfection. We think that celebrating achievements might dampen our drive or cause us to lose focus. So instead, what happens? We strive relentlessly, setting expectations far higher than anyone else would expect of us. But this constant pursuit of perfection only leaves us exhausted and at the end of our tether. Now, it may seem like perfectionism, it may seem like a positive quality, but research suggests otherwise. In a study conducted by uh, Harvard Business Review, HBR, it was found that perfectionists were not better performers at work than non-perfectionists. While perfectionists may put in more hours and be highly invested, They also set rigid and excessively high standards, evaluate themselves too critically, and dismiss positive feedback. Now, these collective tendencies led to higher levels of stress, anxiety, and burndown, and not surprisingly, negatively affecting their performance. So, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative, as I've mentioned earlier, is self-compassion. Now, self-compassion involves three elements. There's self-kindness, mindfulness, and common humanity. So instead of bullying ourselves with harsh judgments and self-critical thoughts and self-doubt, well, we can choose. We can use kinder, more supportive words and thoughts. Mindfulness, on the other hand, it helps us experience emotions without avoiding or exaggerating them. It allows us to take ownership and to persevere. And last but not least, it's recognizing that suffering and failure are part of the human condition, that all humans experience this. And understanding this, this helps us to develop a sense of common humanity. So self-compassion is not about lowering our standards or letting ourselves off the hook. It's about learning that it's okay to struggle and giving ourselves the space to improve. You know, by celebrating small wins and then interpreting failures and successes realistically, we can create a healthier, more sustainable approach to success. It's about understanding that excellence and self-care can coexist and that success is not solely measured by external achievements, but also by inner fulfillment and well-being. Now, I want to take a moment and talk about self-care. I'm not talking about sitting in some spa with some warm stones on your eyes. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, that may be one form, but self-care is going out for a run. It's about lifting weights. It's going climbing. It's walking the dog. It's building model airplanes or whatever you do. It's indulging yourself in your pastimes, in your hobbies. That is what self-care is about. That is a much broader uh, contextual definition of what I mean by self-care. 
So now what I'd like to do is circle back to my client, Katya. You know, as Katya continued her journey of integrating self-compassion into her work life, she started noticing some remarkable changes, and she brought this up week to week when we met. You know, she became more resilient in the face of challenges and setbacks, as she no longer viewed them as personal failures, but rather as opportunities for growth and learning. She approached her work with a sense of curiosity and openness, which in turn fostered creativity and innovation within her firm. Now, moreover, Katya discovered that when she showed herself kindness and understanding, it actually positively impacted her relationships with colleagues and clients. She was surprised by this. I mean, this is a given, but when we are not used to it, 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 it we can be flabbergasted by this. You know, by cultivating self-compassion, she was able to extend that same empathy and support to others. And this created a culture of collaboration and psychological safety. The ripple effect of Katya's transformation extended beyond the workplace. You know, she started prioritizing her own well-being, setting boundaries and making time for self-care activities that replenished her energy. She got her mojo back. You know, she realized that taking care of herself was not a selfish act, but a necessary foundation for her overall success and happiness. You know, as Katya shared her experiences with close colleagues, others in her firm began to question their own pursuit of perfection and the toll it was taking on their lives. They started seeking a healthier balance between striving for excellence and practicing self-compassion. I can safely and assuredly say that her workplace became a space where people could openly discuss their challenges and support one another in finding sustainable approaches to success. The movement towards embracing self-compassion slowly gained momentum in Katya's firm. But over time, the leaders of the organization recognized the true value in creating a thriving working culture. Katya's firm had always talked about and, and focused on training about uh, relationship management and social awareness. But after taking on self-compassion, there was a shift in the training, a more balanced shift where they talked more about self-awareness and self-management. There was more of focus on well-being initiatives and leadership development focusing on nurturing self-compassion. You know, they understood that by supporting their employees' holistic well-being, they could unlock their full potential and drive long-term success. In the midst of the shift, Katya emerged as a prominent advocate for self-compassion in the workplace. So now I'd like to challenge and invite you to reflect on Katya's story and the lessons she drew from her experience. The question is, how often do we fall into this trap of living up to the highest standards by sacrificing our own well-being for the sake of perfection? What if we could rewrite the narrative, rewrite the story we tell ourselves and embrace self-compassion as a catalyst for success? As a take-home message, dear listener, I I want you to remember, I'd like you to recall that success is not an all-or-nothing game. I truly feel it's about finding harmony between pursuing excellence and taking care of ourselves. It's about understanding that self-compassion is not a sign of weakness, far from it, but a profound act of strength and resilience. So as I said, I'd like to challenge you to challenge the conventional notions of success and redefine what it means to thrive in our work and our lives. So if I may be so bold to state, let's prioritize self-compassion. Let's celebrate our progress and create a culture within our companies, within our teams, within our departments and our divisions that supports well-being and sustainable success. Well, folks, that brings us to the tail end of episode one of season four. You know, thank you for joining me on this episode as we explored the fascinating world of building resilience. So stay tuned for the future episodes where we'll continue to dive into the strategies, the insights, and the inspiring stories and experiences that will empower you on your journey toward resilience and well-being. You know, I really had fun today on this solo project. It's been a while since I've done it. 
I don't know why I don't do more of these solo projects. So I think on my mental radar, I will. It's just I get so caught up in the fascinating interviews I have with my guests and the the, the, the stories they tell. You know, I, I find it brilliant. I find it so motivating. I learn so much on this podcast. And I guess that's a great advantage because I have the luxury and the privilege of picking these high caliber guests for interviews. And I get to pick their minds and understand their their mindsets. And I learn so much from them. And I hope through the medium of this podcast that it allows you to pick up some of the stories and skills for yourself and for those that you care for and those that you lead and those you call colleagues and friends and family. And as I've communicated ad nauseum, if you could please recommend, rate, and suggest this podcast to two friends, two family members, two colleagues, maybe you can take a moment and post something on one of your social media feeds, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, if you're a TikTok kind of person, LinkedIn, all of it and any of it would, you'd be doing me a big solid of spreading this message. And if any of you would like to send me a direct comment, question, share some feedback with me, you can find my contact information in the show notes. But anyways, folks, thank you for allowing me to be part of your week. Until next week, I will see you then. Keep well, keep strong, and we'll speak soon. Thank you.